Okay. Okay. Um, uh, so, um, uh, suggested topics? Anything anybody wants to talk about? Um, I have um, very early updates on the service worker approach for containment. Oh, great. <coughs> I'd like to hear about that. And um, uh, so my topic is um, uh, essentially a continuation of uh, the conversation we had last week. I found the conversation last week tremendously helpful at getting me started in a good direction. Uh, I still uh, don't have running code, um, but I've got, um, uh, in, in getting code as worked out as I have for what I have in mind for a safe module system, I uh, learned a lot. It's actually quite different than the code I showed last week. Uh, I think it has some uh, very clear properties, um, some of which are a bit surprising. Um, uh, so I was um, uh, uh, hoping to go through that some, at least at a high level. Um, I said, I did, this is just the module JS for which I did send out a link on the SES, uh, um, uh, SES meetings or SES strategy mailing list. Yeah, I'd like to go over that. I, I, I think uh, the thing that you went over last week was interesting, but a little weird. And hopefully, as as uh, as the rubber meets the road, some of the weirdness can be uh, eroded away. Uh, I think we'll find this one is more weird. Oh well, okay. <laughs> but I think also well, there's, yes, there's weird and there's weird. I mean, there's 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 the. Um, Gosh, that's awkward versus gosh, that's clever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are um, uh, some things that are awkward making about um, the ECMAScript module system um, uh, that are preserved in SES, but banned in Jesse. Uh, so a pure Jesse module system, or you know, the, the subset of, of SES modules that are allowed directly by Jesse, uh, don't have the particular things that made this so weird. Um, uh, those, I'll just mention, those things are uh, live bindings and um, visibility of temporal dead zone, especially under cycles. Um, so the whole thing about cyclic imports and all the cases that that creates um, uh, um, are, are uh, necessarily very weird making. Um, Sorry, but um, just um, um, make a note that I, I do want to talk about the TDD aspect um, at some point later on, um, and uh, live bindings because those were the two things. Like actually, sorry, live bindings was the one thing that I really thought required a little bit more in the spec. Um, but TDD, um, I think um, um, you know there, there's a discussion about how. It is naturally handled by the encapsulation model. Uh, just before we get too deep into things, uh, I also wanted to ask that we briefly review the idea of a standard module for Jesse. Okay. Good. Um, good. So, um, uh, so in any case, let's uh, let's take it in the order we suggested it. And uh, Sala, why don't you start with um, uh, the uh, the safe, the safe browser frame. Um, yeah, well, it, it's, it's um, a little bit soon to actually talk about the safe browser frame. Um, I just have an implementation that I that made me, um, you know, exercise the different aspects of, of service workers that will affect um, the design of the container. Um, and based on that, I basically outlined where uh, browser inconsistencies will be um, troubling um, and where potentially the service worker spec can actually uh, leverage, um, you know, um, assistance, in making this a much, much more palatable experience. Um, so, so what you're seeing here is basically um, an iframe um, backed by a service worker. Um, so it's kind of like a mini browser. Um, it uses a concept 
um, that extends on the idea of scopes, where in a service worker um, model, you have um, a service worker that's a separate thread that executes for a particular scope. Um, and then um, my, my approach for, for um, encapsulating you know, uh, another domain is basically to put it inside an, a subscope of the containers. Um, so there are... Let me ask a question already, because I, I, I'm not, I, I'm uh, much more ignorant on the web side of things than I am on the JavaScript, JavaScript side of things. This notion of a scope. Yes. Uh, uh, so I know what the uh, browser notion of an origin is, um, uh, or I'm actually a little bit unclear about the difference between origin and host, but we probably don't need to go into that. Um, uh, uh, from the way you were highlighting things, I think a scope is basically um, something that's like a subtree of that, where the notion of slashes as separators uh, is recognized in the concept of the scope? Yes. So um, the idea from that um, comes specifically from, from the notion that for security purposes, a service worker that is found in this folder should not have reach except for the folders that are at this level or below it. So this is where the idea of scope came from. They okay. said, you know, if a domain is shared by multiple, um, uh, you know, services, security would, would uh, be required that the service worker does not reach over its own um, folder, its own parent folder. Okay. Um, so, so scope is kind of like an origin with a little bit of a path, uh, you know, a, a few directories down, like, like which wherever, wherever you set the scope, um, the spec says that the service worker should be able to uh, intercept any, um, um, it, you know, any uh, fetch operations for that scope or below it, um, as long as the um, page that registered the service worker uh, is either in that scope or is requesting from that scope. Oh, the, the page is in that scope or requesting that scope. From that, okay. yeah. So let me make sure I understand. Um, uh, if a page that's in that scope mm -hmm. is making a request to a completely different origin, it will still go to this service worker? That is what I want to find out next week because um, like that would be very wishful thinking, but it, it might actually, like, like last week I had a surprise where if my page was here um, and my page requested something here, and since it was under the service worker, it actually allowed the service worker to intercept this request. So that was a surprise. It was unexpected. Um, um, and the next surprise, which I'm hoping for, which I confirm next week, is whether or not if this page here can access another domain completely and still have service worker interception. Yeah, that was one of the things where I felt like we needed a fundamental change is my understanding without having ever tested or investigated very much um, uh, was that uh, service workers were uh, essentially trying to be a local emulation of what would be a remote server at an origin uh, and therefore only requests to that origin would go to any particular service workers which makes it useless for confinement makes it you know makes it by itself useless for confinement but if, if we can actually have it intercept all requests from the page, that would be wonderful. Yeah, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't design around this uh, idea that it can intercept other domain names because there will be um, reluctance surprises uh, because initially, yes, service workers were supposed to be, I get the service worker from Google, I get access to Google Things because I have a particular API uh, privilege that allows my domain to do certain things with the Google domain. That was the initial idea. Um, and Google wanted to get to that point where you are giving people a worker for your domain 
to use on their domain um, at the client side. That was really the idea. But but everything, um, you know, at that level was basically um, clipped gradually out of the uh, out of the spec as it became a, a spec. Um, and I was surprised to actually see that it was it was able to pierce at least within the scope, you know, uh, same origin piercing was, you know, a little surprising for me. Um, so um, the second thing, though, is that they are flimsy. They don't always catch the costs, and you cannot generally uh, depend on the fact that the spec says something will be available for you to depend on and know that all browsers will actually conform. Yeah. By the way, let, let me let me interrupt um, uh, uh, for a moment and say uh, you and I have a lot of context on this. Uh, several of the people in, that, in this call share that context, but several uh, probably do not. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you, we do. Um, why don't I say a few words about sort of in general what we're trying to accomplish here, and then uh, let's let's you know take questions from everybody else until we're all sort of in sync on what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, so, uh, um, in, in Kaha, uh, as the, the first um, time we've tried to do something object capability-like for general web content, um, uh, the idea was not just that we do an object capability subset of JavaScript, but we allow the JavaScript to think that it's running in a browser um, uh, while it's actually running in a browser, but that uh, the, what we give it access to is a um, uh, confined environment in which it can still interact with the user. Uh, so in, ja in Kaha, we did that by wrapping the DOM and therefore having to emulate the entire DOM API in our wrapper. Uh, and by wrapping, uh, give the uh, confined code uh, access to um, a DOM subtree, a subtree of the genuine DOM that was mapped to a virtual uh, iframe, something that looked iframe-like, um, uh, as well as virtualizing all the other um, uh, browser globals, XML, HTTP requests in particular. Uh, so the whole browser uh, API to JavaScript, um, uh, combined with re re rewriting the HTML and rewriting uh, CSS, which I'm not going to touch. Uh, touch on more today unless it's relevant. Uh, but we found that um, the effort to emulate the DOM API was actually much harder than the effort to do SES uh, because uh, the, browser DOM, the browser DOM API is like one of the worst um, uh, APIs that humanity has ever designed. Um, and uh, it was incredibly hard to emulate it accurately. So uh, what we're now trying to do instead is to use the various mechanisms that the browser has to see if we can compose them into a means to create a genuine iframe with a genuine DOM tree that we can uh, afford to give direct access to to confined SES code, uh, where the SES code cannot cause effects outside the iframe that we don't authorize, that the creator of the iframe did not explicitly authorize. So access to the user uh, would be only in um, uh, the, the rectangle that's showing that iframe and only receiving user interface events that are directed to that rectangle. So that, that's, that part's uh, pretty fine. Uh, you have to prevent them from climbing out of it, prevent them from using all the ways you can get a DOM to evaluate code to prevent them from evaluating uh, uh, raw JavaScript code that's not subject to the SES restrictions. Uh, but most of all, uh, the hard part was um, uh, trying to intercept all network access. There's all sorts of ways to provoke uh, a DOM to get the browser to do network access in reaction to something that happened with the DOM. Uh, such as putting in a tag that has some source equal um, uh, attribute. Um, and since we did Kaha, 
the browser specifications and implementations have routed all of those network requests through the fetch API. Uh, so that the ability to intercept fetch in general was, gives us the ability to confine the network requests generated by the DOM. Uh, and now we're investigating whether the browsers themselves unmodified have enough mechanism that we can successfully intercept all those fetches. Um, uh, so uh, first of all, does that seem like um, an accurate portrayal of our shared understanding of what this exercise is trying to do? Perfectly, yeah. Okay. I, I, have, I have a question about that. Okay. You say everything goes through the fetch API. What does that mean? Okay, so it started off, I believe, um, as uh, just an internal function, uh, you know, a specification fiction, so that the specification was refactored, so that all the things that needed to go to the network went through an internal function on the way to the network. Um, uh, and then uh, there was also a new API that was added to uh, the browser API essentially a wrapping of XML HTTP request uh, that is a fetch function, but that's not the answer to the, that's not the one that I mean, because uh, the fetch function uh, that's made visible um, uh, is one of the routes to the internal fetch function, but the, um, uh, but, but for example, replacing the visible fetch function with something else does not intercept the fetches that are generated by the DOM. So when you say the, the, the visible fetch function, you mean a function which is exposed to the JavaScript layer? Yes, yes. There's a global, I believe it's a global named fetch that uh, you can think of as wrapping uh, XML HTTP requests. It gives a a, a more convenient promise-oriented API to XML HTTP requests. Um, uh, and, um, uh, but, but, but just like replacing HTTP, XML HTTP requests with the safe wrapper uh, doesn't change the DOM behavior, replacing, replacing the, the, the visible binding of the global fetch with the safe wrapper uh, does not change the DOM behavior. However, uh, there is this service worker mechanism that we're exploring that does allow you to intercept some fetches under some conditions. Um, and uh, what fetches it enables you to intercept under what conditions is something that um, uh, we're still trying to pin down. So this would be things like inserting an image tag into your, into your DOM tree or something like that. Yes, yes, that's a perfect example. So Kaha did all of this by complete intermediation between the confined JavaScript code and the genuine DOM, and that intermediation understood all of the contexts in which text that was a URL was being passed through in such a way as to cause network access. And we had an, a, a, an HTML rewriter that would remap uh, all those names, uh, however the creator of that confinement box wanted to do it. So you could think of it as an MMU for, for addressing the web. It was completely, you could do whatever remapping of the namespace you would like. Right, because it's brittle under evolution of the browser. Uh, the Kaha mechanism was not. Uh, oh, no, well, y yes, in the sense that if they add, if they add some new thing, to, to uh, the browser that gives you a new way to do that, your emulation just doesn't have it and therefore it's not available um, at all. Right, that's correct. Whereas if you give the confined code direct access to the DOM nodes, uh, then uh, you are depending on an understanding of imposed limits on what they can do given those DOM nodes and um, uh, a future version of the browser or simply a different browser that you didn't test on might very well violate your, your, the limits that you're assuming. 
So I, I do have a question. Um, um, I think um, it, it goes to what um, uh, Chip was saying. Um, with Kaha, when, uh, when uh, custom elements or web components, the whole like trifecta, um, when they start showing up, um, how much effort or was there effort made to actually adopt those specs as well? So, uh, so here's where Kaha fails, which is it was always trailing uh, the JavaScript specification and the browser specification. Uh, and it was only catching up here and there as use cases uh, demanded it. Uh, and uh, for the last five years or so, um, uh, uh, oh, sorry, for the last, for the, for the first four years of the last five years or so, sorry for the strange locution, um, uh, Kaha was maintained only in the 20 percent time with myself and Kevin Reed. Uh, since I left Google about a year ago, uh, Kaha is now maintained only in the 20 percent time of Kevin's. Uh, so uh, the Kaha, the SES in Kaha, is really ECMAScript 5 oriented. It's not um, up to date with modern JavaScript, which is why uh, uh, Agoric and Salesforce did this uh, interesting effort to, to rebuild Kaha, sorry, sorry, to re rebuild SES from scratch for modern JavaScript. Uh, regarding the browser APIs, um, Kaha does not know anything about web components. It has no notion of shadow DOM trees or anything. Uh, there's a bit of an interesting history there that I'll just touch on, which is uh, when web components started, it looked like it might be a, a way to get a security mechanism directly into the browser that allowed Kaha, that would have allowed Kaha to use the security mechanism directly to avoid the need to wrap the DOM because essentially what we're doing by putting a layer in front of the DOM is very much something like what Web Components is doing by putting a DOM in front of the Shadow DOM. Sorry, are you talking about mode closed for Shadow DOM? I'm sorry? Like the mode closed option of a Shadow DOM that, that doesn't uh, expose it on the element itself? Um, um, I, I no longer know the Shadow DOM work well enough to, to understand the question. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> So, but, yeah, but like, let me just just put the history to rest. That yeah. effort failed. The the people do some of the people doing the shadow DOM work were interested. Enough were not interested, and they wanted to ship something on a timetable, uh, such that it just didn't happen in a way that provided us what we need for security. So Kaha itself is basically is stuck in what is mostly um, an HTML HTML four understanding of the of the DOM and browser API. All right, thank you. So I guess, uh, are there other questions or should I continue digging a bit about uh, fetch and service workers maybe? I, uh, Okay, hearing silence, uh, please continue. Okay, so I I'm just showing here because um, since we talked about fetch being, you know, the central um, um, or yeah, the central way for, for all requests that the browser will make, um, this table really just hits the spot because our use for workers and iframes is in order for us to enforce CSP to prevent um, um, unauthorized requests. Um, and the fact that we're using service workers, we are going to be intercepting requests that will be one of, any, one of those um, types of destinations. So this table is really a, you know, the, the overlap of everything we're working on. Um, so, so just very quickly, um, you know, document there's two of them. Um, because I believe what happens here is um, when you get an iframe, yeah, so it says right here, if there is an iframe, um, you could have a CSP directive that limits which URL uh, an iframe can load on your page. 
Um, but there's also a second document, which is really um, from the iframes perspective, it's making a document request um, as a navigation request. Mm. And I'll clarify this bit because it's very important. Um, so there are four modes of requests. Um, you know, the ones that you do usually, um, you know, in API form is one of the first three or, or WebSocket if you use those. Uh, but navigate is what happens on your behalf when you're loading a page in a browser. Um, this one is not covered by the Fetch API itself. Um, it's covered in the Fetch layer, and it's interceptable by a service worker. I'm sorry, it's covered by in the what layer? Um, and, and the Fetch layer, like internally. <clears throat> and it is interceptable by the service worker, although the service worker cannot go around and make a navigate fetch request even if it got a fetch request that is navigate. I, you know, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. It will be easier to see in code. Um, but but that's, that's the most important thing that most, if you've never used service workers, you would hardly ever, uh, I think you would never have dealt with a navigate um, fetch uh, in any way. Um, so, so with those two, you know, and, and, and the quick over, overview of what we're trying to do. Um, I basically put together this um, uh, custom element that, it, that wraps an iframe, and it comes um, with, an, with another class um, called um, um, like a sandbox container. Um, and that sandbox container is basically what handles the service worker um, uh, API um, on, on a document level. So it, it creates the service worker registration um, and um, ensures that the frame will, um, will always navigate to the service worker by, by making sure it's registered appropriately. Hey, Salah, could yeah. you show your elements just to show what this structure of this page is? Yeah. So um, also, let me just mention. Uh, usually, the, uh, the, I'm hearing your audio clearly, but occasionally it sounds muddy. I'm wondering if there's something easy to do with positioning your microphone. Um, I think the only thing that changed is I have a, like a large fan in the room today, so I'll just put it at a different angle. Maybe there's like uh, just air or something like the breeze. Um, is that better? No. Oh, okay. So, yeah, give me one sec. Yeah, there's a little, a little uh, buzzy echo to everything you say. Oh, uh, an echo might be that if everybody else mutes while Sala is talking, that may help, and I will now mute. Um, can you hear me, or? Yeah, I think you can only improve things. <laughs> All right, cheers. Um, yeah, so so um, so the structure of the elements is you know it's just very very straightforward. Um, there's a, a sandbox frame, um, and in there at some point there's actually an iframe. Um, so the sandbox frame is really what houses the, um, the iframe that, that is controlled um, to, you know, hit the service worker, basically. Um, and, you know, some UI, basically, for the, uh, like, address bar or navigation bar. Um, and I wanted to make sure we have the ability to have, like, a built-in console. I don't use it for a console now, but it's there. Um, so, so this is basically the, um, the idea here is that a sandbox frame has um, authority to manipulate both the iframe and the console. Um, and those two have no authority um, outside their own uh, confinement, basically. Um, how the console will tie to the iframe, I'm not sure at this point. Um, I, I didn't need to use um, like a virtual console so far, uh, but that will be a very, very interesting thing to work on. 
Um, so I guess, um, is that a good overview of the elements? Yeah, that's good, thanks. All right. Um, so what, what happens when, you're, um, when you want to um, register a service worker? I don't think there is a better way to start this. Uh, when you want to get a service worker to act on your behalf from a page, uh, you actually have to call uh, navigator.serviceworker.register, um, and then you give it a URL for a particular script, um, and you define the scope. Um, and then you do a little dance of like awkward uh, promises and stuff like that to make sure the service worker is up to date or if it's going to be cached. Um, all this is happening and um, debuggability is like, you know, like it, it's awful. Um, and in every browser, you uh, find surprises. Sometimes you register and it just works immediately as soon as you make the next call in some browsers. Chrome is very, very eager to give you service worker access. Um, places like Safari are like, um, it depends on the month, I'm not sure. Um, and Safari likes to always keep things that are not a security risk, but just sound like people might want. <laughs> Uh, so if it's useful, you're going to have to like wait for Safari to make a you know a recommendation for a change in the spec um, or um, work around it. Um, uh, could you give a, just an example of uh, a security issue that comes up with regard to Safari? Yeah, we will get to that exactly in one second. Okay, great. That, that was why I really, really um, suffered last week. Um, so, so um, but once you have a registration, you have gone over the first hurdle. Um, I, I registered the service worker like two years ago or so, um, and I'm, I'm still learning how to register it today. Um, I don't have any production use for service workers, but I always explore if they can be used. And it feels like I'm learning it like, you know, all over again every single time. Um, but it, it, it's very simple. You, um, you basically get a registration. And this, this object is almost identical to the object of the registration that is globally scoped in the service worker threat. Um, so um, there are a lot of like features that you know, I, I don't think we need at all or even need to worry about. Um, but the fundamental things we need to worry about are um, um, state, you know, the state of the service worker, whether it's actually active or activated, or whether there are updates, it might be installing the updates. Uh, so, so events that relate to the fact that you might get a different thread in a, in a second or two to service your fetch events, um, this um, um, uh, transition or layover um, is, is a very, very um, challenging time for, for us to ensure that everything hits the service worker. Um, the second aspect is that uh, just like any other worker, you could actually have a, uh, like a post message. Uh, so messages can go back and forth. Um, and yet I find that if we're doing this to contain and secure things, Messages are not really the best approach, I, I believe. You know, we're going to wait and see. Um, the other thing is the fact that you, know, you can tell the scope by just looking at the registration. Um, and from the client side, the, the top page registered the service worker on this scope. And from there, as soon as it knows that it is registered and active, it can safely load any URL that falls under the scope in an iframe. And that's, that's where its, um, it's um, you know, sphere of control really ends, because what will happen from there is the service worker and the other frame will, um, will start to actually you know, um, continue that logic that you, you were working on on the main thread. Um, it's a really, really bad, um, you know, story. <laughs> so um, 
so so the, the basic test I had was um, like a simple page that loads a JavaScript file uh, that adds a class onto an element and a CSS file that styles a particular element in a particular way. And if I saw hello world with the exclamation mark, I know that everything is working. Um, this is the most basic kind of um, you know, um, interception you would do. You want to make sure that all the resources are being loaded um, and, and, you know, and your service worker is able to service every single request um, in, a, in, a, in a way that is, um, you know, controlled. Um, it doesn't, like, um, show any surprises. And that, tests were, that test specifically works well in all browsers with a little bit of a, you know, um, ju just some, some uh, you know, affordance for Safari in some cases. Um, so those three requests are the HTML page. And that basically is a navigate. Um, there are all kinds of details that I just throw on here um, for uh, traceability and you know, for me to actually have a better picture. Um, the, Critical thing is that a request has to be tied to a particular frame uh, or a particular client, um, and just just uh, you know, a client in this kind of request will always be the iframe. It will never be the parent page, um, and. Uh, I guess um, other other properties you see here are related to the fetch. Um, options that you would uh, add to a fetch call uh, of the same effect. Um, the idea here is that the service worker will be able to know from the um, name of the folder under containers uh, which um, remote URL it maps to. Um, you know, I thought that was the most basic approach for sandboxing um, a domain against you know a container, um, a scoped container. Um, the remote URL is basically uh, just three levels up um, slash test instead of experiments. So technically, it is um, outside the, the scope, but it's still within the origin. Um, so after the first request and after the worker is able to actually map test to the remote URL, it will then expect any fetches that, that have the same client identity to, um, to be sandboxed if they, um, if they are underneath the, the um, container um, and to be unsandboxed otherwise. Um, in some cases, it will actually block them. But you know, those are all just um, details we can talk about down the road. Um, so for the CSS. Um, it was able to reroute the uh, dot slash hello world dot CSS uh, from the original uh, remote URL to the one that is actually inside the container. Um, and, and that happened because the page literally says dot slash, so it expects it to actually auto sandbox. Um, and it did the same for the JavaScript file. So all those files, like containers, literally has. Uh, I can actually show that. So containers. Uh, let's get the right one. Literally has the service worker. It doesn't have any other files. Um, the fact that we're getting all this um, from you know virtual. Uh, folders without necessarily having to hit the net um, is actually what the service workers are able to give us. Um, so, so that's the basic, um, you know, sanity check that I did, um, and then I threw in one uh, another request that has a lot more, um, you know, surprising aspects. Um, I'm basically loading my own website, which would be really um, 
different origin, not the same origin. Um, I'm just loading the landing page. Um, and the interesting thing is that I'm, I use um, relative, um, uh, root relative, um, you know, um, um, hrefs and SRCs and a lot of the things I use because those are multiple repos on GitHub and you know the slash is the only way I can really navigate between the different um, repos. Um, and I thought that over here there will be uh, trouble to actually contain this and to my surprise the service worker was actually able to intercept um, a request that was not uh, sandboxed. Uh, so the fact that it started with a slash made it resolve against localhost, not against the container. Uh, and yet the service worker had enough uh, authority to intercept that request. So, and I think this is, um, Mark, this is the part that you were uh, trying to, um, um, you know, take a little bit further and see whether or not it will intercept a different URL completely. Um, and for that, I wanted to get everything solid. Um, you know, I can debug reasonably, um, you know, in the same way. Um, and then next week I was going to start doing that. And um, the fact that we can do a CSP policy um, and have it enforced um, was also going to be next week's topic. Here. Um, so I guess that's, that's the overview of this. Okay, uh, that's, that's really great. Um, so uh, some questions. Uh, first of all, uh, let's go back to um, uh, the uh, Safari example of a, of a security issue that comes up with Safari or just a, a, an issue that comes up with Safari? Yeah, I'll show you right now in the log how Safari likes to, um, you know, Safari always likes to, um, you know, make it feel like people are trying to, um, you know, violate security and, and give people their money or something. I don't know, like it feels like they are more um, aware of our needs for privacy than we are. Um, but um, unlike Chrome, Safari has to inspect the service worker in a, in a different window altogether. Um, so what's happening here is that, um, notice how in, in Chrome, I was basically able to say those are unsandboxed. Um, in Safari, I could not verify uh, in using the available service worker um, um, aspects that the request being made is actually um, being made by a sandboxed um, iframe. Um, and here's the reason. Um, in, in the service worker spec, you have um, on the event, you have two properties that can, I, can help you determine which frame um, you need to uh, attribute this request to. The client ID is um, a property that tells you that this request is, um, is um, a fetch that is happening by a frame, by a frame, either because it's loading a sub-resource on its page or because a fetch API call was made. Um, the second type of client ID, which they are not still clear on in the spec, uh, would be uh, either called um, resulting client ID. I'm sorry, there's a, did you say client ID or ID? ID, as in, uh, as in I, as in I, as in identifier. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the resulting client ID or the reserved client ID, I'm not sure which one they'll go with in the end, is what you would get once the browser context is created somewhere in order for a navigation to start happening. So if my iframe loads another page, uh, the fetch event will have a client ID that is about to expire, 
and the resulting client ID that only has a browser, a browser context, but not a document yet. Um, and it's basically saying that this page that you are fetching right now will become the new um, um, you know, base, the, the new document that will uh, populate um, the DOM of this browser context um, and the ID that you will track all future requests happening on its behalf is the resulting client ID. Um, so in order for me to sandbox in Chrome, you know, when I was designing this, I said, okay, so I get a resulting client ID. I call it receiver here for just, just to keep things short. Um, and I could also have gotten an initiator if the iframe had a page that in which I click a link um, to start navigating to a different page. So this would be the client ID and this would be the resulting client ID. Um, and once I had that, I said that any, any requests that are valid from an initiator that has this ID from now on will be either sandboxed if it's under containers, under the same container, or unsandboxed if it's, um, you know, okay, it's an acceptable request, but it's not under the container itself. It's actually, you know, escaping it for some reason. Um, in Safari, I couldn't get it. Do the specs themselves um, uh, say which behavior is correct? And are yeah. Yeah, um, uh, Chrome and Firefox uh, and the spec um, are, are in agreement. Let's put it this way. Uh, so, so Chrome uh, gives me the, the things that when I read the spec and I wrote my logic and I wanted it to work, it worked. Um, however, Safari was working for other reasons or not working and I didn't know. Um, but when I dug very, very deep into, um, you know, discussions happening about what they will actually make, you know, the changes they'll make down the road, um, I believe Safari is holding out. Um, so Safari is definitely um, introducing something that I will not concern myself with until, you know, very late in development. Let's put it this way. Um, does that, um, you know, like, um, does that clarify it or? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, I can't say that I followed it all, but I'm, but uh, it's one of the wonderful things about uh, recording is I can go right. back over it sometime to, to yeah. understand so, it in some detail. So Safari refuses uh, in the initial request to identify the browser context that I should start tracking from now. They think it's enough for me to start tracking whenever you know, I get lucky and get a fetch request, and then I know enough information uh, to do service worker without actually knowing anything about the user. That I think that's the rationale uh, of what Safari is doing. So since I cannot track from the first navigation, I technically do not know whether or not any subsequent requests are sandboxable or not, all I can say is that if they are all from the same initiator, I will allow them all to access things in one sandbox, in one container. And if they violate that, I will start blocking them. This so, is, yeah. Um, so would this be made easier if your service worker was only running within the one container, or is that possible? Well, that, that could be possible, um, but um, you know, we're, we're distributing um, across a number of threads. Um, and, and I thought to myself, I can have a lot of moving threads and moving parts and you know, debugging over a page and a worker is hard enough. Um, I just didn't know, like once you have more than one service worker, here, here's what happens sometimes. Um, a page that tries to get something that falls under the scope of another service worker um, may be intercepted by one or the other depending on the browser. That, that's a potential complication. Um, 
but um, you know the, the default behavior should be that if it fell under the scope of another service worker, it will show up there. Um, only the other service worker is, um, is completely isolated and has no knowledge of other service workers. So it will be getting a request that may or may not be clearly attributed to a frame, but it will likely not have any knowledge of that frame. So, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so, so I wanted to keep at least some sort of um, um, wiggle room where we say, listen, I know that this frame is really trying to do something it's not allowed to unless we actually allow containers to, uh, to you know, multiple containers reflecting one or more subdomains um, of, of a particular domain for a particular page, then, then you know, this, this dance between many workers will be impossible. I have a question for Manuel regarding uh, Walker service. Uh, so, as I understand it, uh, Walker service um, uh, is also providing uh, some kind of virtualized DOM access with many of the same goals as with Kaha and many of the same goals that we're trying to achieve uh, here. Um, uh, and that uh, currently, uh, Locker service does that uh, with a different uh, complex uh, scheme around the DOM API. Um, uh, if we're successful with um, the approach uh, that Sala is doing, which is uh, certainly, if it works out, is vastly simpler than what Kaha was doing, and my sense is vastly simpler than Locker Service. Would Locker Service be interested in adopting this for the browser DOM API side of what they're doing? Well, that's exactly why I'm here, right? To learn what this is about, because you are right. It's been it's been really hard for Locker the way we're doing it to keep up with the browser API. You know, that's exactly this. We have the same pain. Uh, you know, because we are maybe our use case is more narrow to our customer base, etc. So far, we are like you know, kind of like in an okay zone. This is we need to scale, and in order to scale, the the strategy that we have so far is not going to work. So that's why we are here to listen and to see because we need to simplify our architecture. We have other efforts internally to Salesforce to simplify the local local uh, architecture. And, uh, but they're just getting started. And so, you know, this is part of it. So to understand how this can maybe, you know, help us the same way. Okay. And with Salesforce's uh, throw weight, so to speak, um, if things are sort of delicately and accidentally securable now, um, uh, uh, with Salesforce, um, uh, you know, throwing their weight behind uh, the, those security properties, uh, it can give us a lot more confidence that uh, things don't evolve in a way to break the security because then it would break locker. Uh, and we could probably get a lot, you know, anything that's an accidental securability property now that we'd like to get written more normatively into the specs. Uh, we probably Absolutely. And again, that's why, you know, we are participating because we want to both listen to what this group has been thinking about and the problem space and all that because you know it's very very similar and also you know if we can help by with the problems that we have uh, you know again we have very specific scopes and, and concrete examples fantastic right this is just cross-pollination to make things better mm -hmm. uh, so yeah absolutely okay great let me just uh for for everyone's orientation let me, let me break up the salesforce contributions that Agoric is aware, aware of into uh, three, uh, three parts. Uh, um, Agoric and Salesforce are already uh, collaborating on uh, SES as a safe evaluator. Uh, there is the SES shim uh, under Agoric that uh, was written uh, uh, um, assuming that there was that there's some platform way to create a new root realm, a new set of globals, um, and that turned out to be a assumption that SES did not need, and an assumption that gets us into troubles on some platforms. Uh, notably, 
uh, within a worker, speaking of workers, within a worker, uh, you only have one root realm. There's no ability to create multiple root realms that got MetaMask into trouble trying to use the Agoric Shim. Uh, likewise, Agoric itself got into trouble trying to use the Agoric Shim uh, when, we try, when we got our code running on XS, the uh, JavaScript for embedded, where there's all, also only one root realm. So there's another repository that Salesforce and Agoric uh, are collaborating on uh, that Salesforce is hosting for which the plan is to open source it, but it's not actually publicly visible yet, uh, which is a, um, uh, essentially the, the same starting at SES, but, but engineered uh, so that it simply uh, tames the, the root realm that it's in rather than creating and taming a new one. Uh, and Agoric wants to, um, uh, to reconcile with that. Um, uh, and uh, so that once that's, you know, one, so that once it's, it's open, we can have one joint SES that can be used within one frame. Um, uh, so, the, but, uh, so that's the first step. Uh, second step is that neither of the SES shins um, uh, uh, deal with modules. Uh, um, they both deal with safe evaluation through this bizarre use of, of direct eval, uh, but modules still need to be re rewritten. Uh, Salesforce has their own internal module rewriter, uh, rewriting modules to save scripts, uh, but that's not part of the shim that uh, the shim repository that Agoric and Salesforce are collaborating on. And I don't know of plans to open source that. Uh, and then uh, the one we're discussing in this conversation, which is uh, the strange things that Salesforce is doing to, uh, to, to tame the DOM API, uh, is yet a third piece of work uh, that I'm not aware of uh, plans to open source. But, 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 um, uh, but, but clearly, altogether, this group uh, is proceeding towards plans to have open source solutions to all three of those things, which we need. Right, great, yes. Um, so, um, should I um, um, continue or? Uh, yeah. All right. So, so I'm, I'm just going to, um, you know, very quickly summarize that like this week, like, the first week of, of actual uh, tangible development was really focused on trying to find where um, cross browser, um, you know, um, pitfalls will, will potentially surprise us down the road. Um, not uh, and, and and to you know come come to a comfortable realization of which browser um, will be the one that will have to work throughout you know the prototyping phase, um, and um, hopefully by the time the prototyping is done, other browsers either catch up or are in a position or, or we are in a position to actually um, help them catch up uh, with good recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so, so, you know, reflecting on the first week, um, the, the parts that I really did not like, consider at all, um, you know, because I don't want to add complexities or get distracted in, are requests that are not like, uh, um, you know, um, assets being loaded by the page. So I didn't, if, if you do a simple fetch, um, then that's a simple request. Yeah, we have an alert for something. Um, whatever. Um, but if you actually uh, put a second argument to your fetch uh, request um, and start modifying any aspect, uh, like cores or um, you know, if its method is not get. Uh, um, so sorry, Chip. Um, I was just curious what that wave of hand thing would do. I, I have to bail. I have another meeting that I'm being summoned to. Okay. Just to let you know that I wasn't ghosting on you. <laughs> All right. Well, take care.
Yeah, so, so, so I considered complex requests or requests that have, um, you know, parameters to them. They're not um, a result of a very, very simple link or script or uh, style, um, you know, all these elements that you would have in your page or a simple fetch. Um, so, so this complexity um, is something that, um, you know, we'll, we'll have a lot of surprises. Um, and I wanted to get a, a, a very solid, um, you know, traceable implementation in place before we start playing around with those. Um, the second aspect, so, so I, like I created this thread here, just, and I, I replied, you know, with all the different topics that, you know, anyone interested or um, has input on one or the other, it would be very, very helpful um, to actually open a discussion there. Um, I didn't want to create all these different uh, threads uh, and, you know, distract or, um, you know, make it less noticeable which one is, um, you know, like the less noticeable um, that uh, they all relate to the same thing in the end. Um, targeting is the idea that we discussed how Safari was um, making it very difficult to um, adhere to the spec and, and know that a frame is going to be a sandbox frame because it navigates to a container um, path. Um, so the idea of targeting, um, I also propose a few things here, um, but you know, it's still very, very early in the, you know, just, just ideas for discussion really. Um, the last uh, two are, um, potentially going to become recommendations that we can make to the service worker API group or, or folks. Um, one of them is the idea that um, what I'm doing is really, I'm rebasing a URL against the container. Um, and I don't think that rebasing is, you know, a very, very, like a one-time use for service worker APIs. So if the service worker APIs would actually have, um, you know, an additional option for people to use that would allow them to, to uh, delegate to the browser safely containing uh, a domain against a um, container inside the scope, then, you know, that all that heavy lifting that we have to do would really um, be, um, delegated to the browser that already knows how to do most of the work. Um, and the last one was... <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Guys, keep it down. Um, the last one was the fact that um, um, I don't think that there is any browser that has module support for service workers. Um, so, you know, we have to actually, like, I had to re, you know, relearn how to work without modules. Um, and I, I've been doing service worker code for two years. I've been using modules for a year and a half or two. Um, and writing service worker code is, is so bad that you try to actually not write anything in your actual service work. Um, the fact that we are running a particular um, resolver against a particular frame um, made me think of the idea of inlining a, a, a dedicated worker that services a particular iframe as being um, a, a more natural way to think about a service worker for containment. Um, and I'm not sure how that would look like in the spec, but you would associate a worklet, which uh, apparently is a module-based um, uh, thing, um, and that worklet will basically have its, its target as the iframe um, from the service worker's um, context. So all events related to the iframe will be somehow delegated to a worklet that knows how to handle those requests. Um, and import modules um, to actually do that. So SES frame would like be something like imported from unpackage and you would export the default 
class, and then that class will basically uh, create an instance maybe for every frame. Or, or for, yeah. See, seeing this code reminds me of a, another issue uh, to talk about, which is um, uh, uh, in Kaha, we also rewrote uh, all script tags, um, anything that, and as well as event handlers, anything which, which uh, injected JavaScript code as text into the HTML or into the DOM tree so that all of it, all of that JavaScript code went through SES um, uh, to be restricted to SES rules. Uh, the plan that we're talking about here, uh, I, th I think cannot do anything as transparent as that. Um, none of the mechanisms that we're talking about allows us to intercept uh, script execution in the DOM. Uh, um, if we give direct access to the DOM, the only we, way we can do that safely is to say that that frame is CSP restricted to no evaluation, which you can do with CSP. Of course, SES requires evaluation. Uh, so um, what, what I've been assuming, which I, I should have been stating, uh, which corresponds to some of the things we did in Kaha, uh, is that we actually create two, two frames, two same origin frames, one of which contributes the DOM that has no evaluation, uh, the other of which contributes the realm in which we run CES, and then we give uh, only JavaScript objects from the second frame uh, access to only the DOM from the first frame. Uh, and the result is that uh, the SES can, can SES evaluate, uh, but the DOM nodes cannot cause evaluation. Uh, that's safe, but it's not transparent. It means that any use of the script tag in the HTML um, uh, simply fails to, to evaluate rather than uh, somehow being intercepted and run through uh, SES. Yes. Um, so, so, so I'm a little bit more wishful, by the way, and I think that we will, be, we will have a little bit more success that will maybe not require us to have those, um, 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 you know, um, so, you know, proxy approach of, you know, DOM and eval in separate containers. What I'm hoping to actually achieve is, um, is um, to utilize um, CSP is actually landing on iframe. So you could um, um, fine grain a CSP policy permanently on an iframe before you load the first page and then any pages that load from there on in that frame, I believe you know, this is how it applies to all other attributes of the iframe. Um, an iframe created with uh, particular options, in, as soon as it loads a page, um, those restrictions remain on the iframe so that... Uh, you can... the, the, the particular restriction that we would need, let me, let me just restate it explicitly to, because I don't, I, I'd be very surprised if there is any way to do this now, uh, is that uh, within the iframe, we, ex we accept code that thinks it can uh, use uh, script tags or, um, or you know, it, uh, it, the, uh, the event things, basically things that can have little bits of JavaScript embedded in the HTML, mm -hmm. uh, as we did with Kaha, uh, but do it by intercepting that safely Yes. without having to understand the semantics of the DOM separately by writing, you know, by, by avoid the whole essentially parsing of the DOM of, of you know, doing a, a typing of all the DOM contexts um, to intercept all script execution so that the script execution can instead be SES execution through the SES shell. Uh, yes. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you something um, very, very similar in, in concept. Okay. Um, um, I'm just trying to remember. Oh, I actually remembered. That's good. 
Um, so, so what's happening, or should, yeah, what's happening here is I have my renderer that basically um, renders something I called markout, which is like markdown, but, uh, but like better. Um, hopefully it will replace markdown. No, no, it, it, it's just meant to actually have script tags and, and, and other web um, things because the renderer actually runs against a DOM so why restrict things, you know, like, um, so, so if you open this page in, um, like in, in, in Markdown, in literal Markdown, you would see something like, like this. Um, and I wanted to intercept a script and make sure that it has access to the output element in which it's inside. So I'm, I'm doing this encapsulation by preventing the script from executing and then doing it as if it's executing in a, you know, it's, a, it's an output script. It's something I invented, invented out of nowhere and uh, I intercepted the code. Oh, hold on, go, go back to that screen. I, I already have some questions. Yes. Right. Okay, um, so I understand how you can prevent it from executing. What I don't know is without understanding all the places in the DOM where a string would cause something to execute, how do you know that this is something that uh, the page was expressing the desire that this execute so that you can execute it by other means? So, so um, we, we talk about a parent page, I, I, I'm, I'm going to get to that point particularly um, from, 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 you know, trying to relate it here. We're talking about a parent page having access to the DOM and creating the service worker and registering it. When the parent page is navigating, there are at least uh, one or two strategies. The first one is the parent page can use a template element and fetches the HTML of that particular page that it's going to be loading in the iframe, um, and then can use the built-in um, uh, template element um, um, approach to create um, an inert uh, DOM out of the HTML content and be able to walk through the DOM using the normal DOM um, APIs knowing that the code is not going to execute, making subtle changes to scripts to force them to be encapsulated against what would be um, an SES API that will be globally available in the iframe. Um, so whatever sanitization you want to do on a node level, you could have um, the service worker knows it's a, it's a navigation to a document. It says, OK, well, um, um, is anybody the host of this? Yes, the page says yes. Well, sanitize this and give it back to me, and then I'll, I'll, I'll um, return it to the iframe, or sanitize this and put it in the iframe, and I'll know when it happens. So, so that approach of sanitizing against um, a template element is a very, very, um, like, use whatever you have and, and don't do a lot of additional work to potentially solve this problem. Um, Good, that, that, that makes sense to me. And, and, and I'm glad you remind, I keep forgetting about the inertness of templates. And that's a very powerful uh, lever for us to make use of. Um, uh, so, uh, so yeah, that, that makes sense. And, I'm, and it makes me much more hopeful that without any kind of deep knowledge of the DOM, uh, we might be able to safely emulate uh, inline script execution uh, by by running the the code through SES. There, there is a, a, a like a um, like a sunny side to this idea of doing it in a template element um, is because um, iframes have an SRC doc um, over here. And the spec kind of says that if the SRC doc, um, here you would give it a string that is the HTML code that would have been a page loaded in the iframe. Um, 
I, I don't know uh, if it was SRC or another attribute. I believe it was SRC, but in the spec, I read at some point that when there is SRC doc, whatever the URL that was in that other attribute was basically what the page will think it's being served from. So that would allow the page to think that it's coming, you know, from the source, but it's actually coming from a, a, a sanitized SRC doc. Um, that mechanism I didn't really dig deep into, but that would make the service worker fetch the document, give it to the host, and then the host is like, okay, thank you. I'm going to put it now in the frame. And uh, it cuts, um, you know, cuts the uh, round trip um cost um but but you know in all fairness the service worker itself is intercepting a fetch and it can make a fetch and it can uh, deal with the response um so without having to um create dom apis um a um safely um i i don't want the thing is the service worker, if the thing it's fetching is HTML text, I don't want it to have to parse the HTML text accurately in order, uh, in order to transform it into something safe. Well, but, well, but your, your, temp, your template notion, which allows me to uh, turn it into a DOM tree without worry and then proceed to operate on the parsed DOM tree, uh, that makes me feel much more comfortable. Yeah. So, so I, I'm I'm designing like I I initially said SES frame, and then we said okay, Jesse frame will be uh, uh, SES frame extends Jesse frame, and then when I actually went you know sat down and started to code this, I said sandbox frame from which you know uh, SES frame will extend and Jesse frame will extend because I found that the two will not necessarily um, have um, um, you know, um, one extends the other, but rather they both extend a shared thing. Um, so, so one or more strategies for sanitization um, are really what Sandbox Frame is, is trying to allow. Um, the uh, very careful approach, um, which will technically feel, I believe, a little bit, it will require a little bit more overhead um, is to do it with a template element where the browser can only, cannot mess up things unless it will mess it up anyways. Um, so if, if there is a glitch in how some DOM-related thing is mishandled by a browser, the nice thing about the template approach is that, you know, you don't introduce that. It, it, it will happen in the template, and it will happen when you load that. Um, so the other approach, of course, is the parsing approach. And um, accurate parsing is what we all want, but, but it's not necessarily what we all need all the time. Um, you know, if you're, if you're not using this for like transactional, uh, you know, secure things, or if, if you're just using this casually um, or experimentally, um, you might want to actually uh, use the parsing approach if that's, um, if that's going to limit the amount of um, um, interference or overhead or um, you know, back and forth that will uh, take place. So the thing that, I, that has me so excited about the inert template approach uh, is that we just get to use the HTML parser that's already built into the browser with the resulting DOM tree as the AST. Uh, without the parsing itself, uh, without, without having to worry that the parsing itself will cause execution. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I wish we had that for JavaScript in the browser. That would, that would have also made our lives much easier. Um, yeah. So, um, but, but the thing is, I, the reason why I don't want to rely on a user written HTML parser is very much like why I don't want to write result to a user written uh, JavaScript parser is it's notoriously hard to parse accurately. Um, uh, the um, uh, Saul, I know you and I have corresponded about tag soup. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, so uh, Mike Samuel for Kaha wrote the accurate HTML parser for Kaha 
uh, and it was not a job that that any of the rest of us could have done. It was just a tremendously bizarre and careful exercise. Yeah, well, I, I did, I did, you know, a very, very novice uh, attempt at that. Um, so, um, and, and that's that's really, um, you know, that's what I'm trying to say about like. It's it's accurate enough for my purposes. It's this one. So you know, it's an HTML. Um, it has some CSS, and it has some JavaScript, and it's not using any library, basically, or, or the the built-in parser. Obviously, it's not going to be perfect. It's going to have a lot of edge cases. Well, the, the, the problem for security purposes with something with edge cases is the, you know, attackers say, aha, edge cases, that's, a, that's the opportunity. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. So, 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 so that, that's why I think I thought sandbox screen is where um, the overlap of all these worlds will come together. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and the template trick. Yeah, so so it will allow you either to uh, it will allow you to specify how your particular extension of the sandbox frame sanitizes. It, it, it either it sanitizes by template, and then that's like like that's a an additional um, uh, extension that you would do for the sanitize um, aspect of the sandbox frame, or if it uses um, you know a, a custom parser, then uh, that would be another aspect. Of another extension, so, so so sanitization is one of the goals. The method of sanitization um, is is one of the um, things that are meant to be extensions um, supported by the sandbox frame. Um, for Jesse frame, uh, we have uh, partial sanitization happening for a Jesse code in the worker, um, and because basically a Jesse module will run against a uh, translation um, logic um, that, uh, that, you know, comes from the same um, uh, source code that, that parses the uh, Jesse code or, or composites the Jesse code. Um, and it's going to be needed because Jesse code, and I think Michael would be the best person to actually uh, give that summary. Uh, Michael, do you want to talk about how SES, uh, sorry, how Jesse Frame will operate in the service work? Yeah, and Michael, since we only have a half an hour left, uh, if you could also um, uh, talk about uh, your general uh, Jesse module topic, if, if that fits together. Oh, uh, yeah, this should go. Um, let's see. So, essentially, what I'm heading towards is trying to get the same representation of uh, Jesse code into all these different environments and to see what the, what the best abstraction is for interpreting Jesse code so that we can have a simple interpreter in all these environments. Um, so when it comes to the Jesse frame specifically, uh, that's all going to centralize around the same concerns that SES has with the, the same SES evaluator uh, just customized for Jesse whitelist. And um, the only difference is that we'll be restricting the kinds of modules that we can load. So essentially there's not a lot of different work besides what SES frame has, um, aside from being able to limit the subset of JavaScript that you were interested in. Okay, that, that's good. That's the uh, generality I'd hoped for, that really the, 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 the SES framework, uh, the, everything that's not specific to the language is reused independent of whether the language is SES or Jesse. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's where we're heading towards. And uh, Sala's experiment for next week will really help us determine what, whether it's a short trip or a long trip to get to there. Okay. So what about the general issue that you mentioned at the beginning, the topic of uh, SES modules, I'm sorry, Jesse modules? Yeah, um, so in thinking further about the relationship between Jesse and standard JavaScript, um, the approach that I took through Jessica so far was I had a 
global endowments that corresponded to the things that Jesse needed from the environment. Um, I'm thinking now, especially in regards to how SES has this magical module Agoric Harden and Agoric Nat, uh, that these are, these are essentially hooks for the interpreter environment to say, here's something that's outside of your environment that we're going to provide for you. Uh, could you um, uh, could you explain those in as you see them? Because uh, let me first of all admit that when we added those, uh, I didn't like the way we added those, but I don't have an alternative to offer. Uh, <laughs> I see. <laughs> I'm thinking about them right, and I should like them. Uh, so, what I see this as is code that is essentially agnostic as to whether it's running under SES or under a standard JavaScript environment, uh, those kinds of libraries that want to be able to offer the security that SES has and not conflict with it, but at the same time, maybe they want reusability outside the JavaScript environment that would provide that security, um, they can import a module like at agoric slash harden and get the best approximation of what harden should be and the perfect approximation or the perfect implementation underneath the actual SES environment. That's how I see it. Uh, you're still muted, Mark. But... Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, my mistake. Um, uh, okay, so, um... So I followed that. One of the things that's a little disturbing is the layering there is that um, the, it's work, the, in the SES case, it's working through the translation um, of uh, modules into evaluable scripts. Um, that is that uh, it's currently working through the existing packagers that don't have a well specified translation to just do what they do. Um, uh, I suppose we could, for evaluable scripts themselves, just do it by virtue of providing um, uh, those things through the endowments mechanism. Um, but yeah, I. I, I I don't have anything coherent to say about that, but, but, but proceed to talk about how it relates to Jesse. Okay. Um, so what I would like to be able to do is have Jesse source code essentially be entirely self-contained. So in the sense that uh, if my Jesse source code uses make map, for example, as the, the, what I currently have is a global endowment that creates a map. If instead I imported that from some module at agoric slash Jesse, then people who read the code would say, ah, this is Jesse code. I know what this does because I know what this particular import does. Um, and then there are no magical globals at that point. Uh, everything that would have been global aside from the primordials um, and the whitelisted uh, things has behavior that can already be defined in terms of existing JavaScript. So in an existing JavaScript program, if I grab a Jesse module and drop it into place, all I need to know is it depends on agoric slash Jesse. Okay, that, that makes sense to me that um, essentially uh, uh, it's like the discussions that we've had in 39 about standardizing built-in modules, in some sense, the things under the Anagoric namespace would be things that are uh, uh, built in to Jesse and Cess in the sense that they're provided magically uh, and then simply importable modules for, co for, for, for code that's written to run under Jesse and Cess, but just run under JavaScript. Is that, am I getting that about right? Yeah, that's precisely right. Okay. Um, do you, so do you have a list of what these things are? I, I think I recall seeing a list. All the things that uh, Jesse wants to be available that are not part of standard SES? Uh, yes, I'll just bring that up in a sec here. Okay.
That's not my camera. Sure, this one is fine. So it's right here. I can also paste this into the chat if that helps. I'll go ahead and do that. Okay. Um, so this list of, let's see, eight things so far, uh, it still does resolve on some resolution between, uh, re revolves around some resolution between harden and insulate and whatever else we have. But uh, that can be worked out later. I'm not too concerned about that because that's something that's a fairly systematic change to the sources if we need to make it. Um, but basically this list of confine, confine expression, make map, make promise, make set, weak map, and weak set. Okay. And the confine and confine expert are basically like the SES confine and confine expert, except that uh, the, the source code must be within the Jesse subset. That's correct, yeah. And uh, is it would be, would it be a conforming implementation of confine and confine expert to just syntactically validate that the code is in the Jesse subset, and then if so, without any transformation, simply pass it through to the underlying SES confine and confine expert? Uh, so conforming implementation, you mean by SES and Jesse itself? Or yeah, you, yeah, you're okay. right. If you're, running, if you're running within an SES environment, uh, uh, the so yes, yeah, so within an SES environment, uh, you could still import from Agoric slash Jesse. So what would it mean for Agoric Jesse confine to work correctly when run inside an SES environment? Uh, so. If it's in an SES environment, then essentially, yeah, the, the Agoric Jesse implementation in SES would actually need a, a parser or something that would validate the code syntactically, as you said. Okay. And, but and that, that it needs a parser doesn't worry me because Jesse was designed to be simple to parse. Yeah. My so, question is really having syntactically validated, uh, is it then safe? Uh, with regard to conforming to uh, the specification you have in mind for it to only validate, not transform, and then if it validates, simply pass it through to SES confined. Does that fully preserve the semantics you want Jesse confined to have? Uh, the only difference is what's on the whitelist. Um, so things like, uh, for example, object is frozen. I think okay. it's part of SES, but not part of Jesse. Right, okay. So that goes back, good, good. Um, good. Yeah, just to, to um, uh, repeat for everyone, uh, my stance on that is that uh, that's still a conforming implementation of Jesse. It's just not the minimal conforming implementation of Jesse. Uh, because I define Jesse uh, such that a correct Jesse program uh, is not allowed to rely on the presence of any of the SES elements that are absent from Jesse, but neither is it allowed to rely on the absence of those. So a correct Jesse program, when run uh, where the rest in an environment where the rest of the SES standard library is available uh, must still run correctly. Yeah. Uh, as of now, I, I don't think we have uh, a decent way of 
checking to make sure that that's actually true, except by using a whitelist. Yeah. And yeah. that's something we can't really do statically, from what I understand. Yeah. We, we, yeah, we can, because of JavaScript's inability to safely statically analyze, um, uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm fairly convinced that you can't accurately do a static test. You might be able to do a conservative static test, but that's a different matter. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's really, it's a definitional sleight of hand, the fact that I just define Jesse that way. It's certainly useful to have the minimal Jesse whitelist so that you can, even using the SES mechanisms, run a Jesse program and test a Jesse program uh, yeah. in an environment that only has the Jesse whitelist. Precisely, yeah. And that, as you said, it's, uh, it's not the only environment it can run in, but if you run that test, then you can have some assurance that your program should work everywhere. Right. right. Um, um, sorry um, to interrupt, uh, but uh, I hope we will still have a bit of time to discuss the uh, module work that you shared in the group uh, So it's 2.41. Um, uh, I can do that. I'm not sure how far we'll get, but but it's I'll I'll, I'll start with just the high level points. Um, um, I'll start is also there, start sharing it. Sorry, what? Sorry, is there a way we can just uh, uh, give some background on the TDC TDZ um, um, concer concerns that you had in, in, in why you designed the TDZ handling and errors and all of that in a particular way? Uh, 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 one, one second, I, I just have to put the final sentence on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh, can I take this as your blessing to try uh, this experiment in Jessica and see how far I can get? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. absolutely. I'll do that then. I, I have a branch already, but it was taking too much work to justify as uh, just side work. <laughs> okay. No, please. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. So, so would it be fair to say that the first topic next meeting definitely has to be the module work, um, but um, uh, you know that will be the end of the week. And basically, next week is when I want to think about how to model the TDZ problem that you're uh, trying to guard against. So, mm -hmm. it, it would really help. Um, you know, it would be timely if we can just have some um, run through the. EDZ issue that you're foreseeing here. Okay. Okay. So, um, so I'll, instead of just being high level, I'll start at high level, but I'll try to focus in on the TZ, TDZ issue as fast as I can. Uh, TDZ stands for temporal dead zone. Um, so, um, the, So the centerpiece of this code, I'll, I'll um, page forward to it, uh, is make module instance. Um, for, th for those who looked at the code beforehand, I should say that a, a, about a couple of hours ago, I changed, I did a bunch of renaming uh, in preparation for, uh, for this, uh, video conference to have better names for things. So I'll only use the new names here. So uh, a uh, module, so make module instance is kind of the, the core mechanism that I've created here for building a safe module system for SES. Uh, this, um, uh, the, this does not express a loading policy. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a mechanism such that you can build a loader and loading policy around it where you can link a bunch of modules together but give each of them a different binding environment and therefore give them each different initial authorities. Um, uh, and then things like the, um, uh, the manifest approach that we, that we talked about earlier is something that such a loader could consult in deciding how to wire and rename things when hooking things together. Um, but now let's talk about the, the core mechanism here. So I defined something called a module static record uh, that this first parameter is supposed to, uh, pro, pro, you know, you're supposed to provide such a record. Uh, and that's really the core of this proposal. 
uh, is the definition of that record and how this um, make module instance processes that record. So I call it a module static record because it differs from the module record of the ECMAScript spec. The module record of the ECMAScript spec is sort of a module instance in formation. And I find that I found that terminology confusing. So in this thing, I only have module static record and module instance. The module static record contains only information that derives from an individual module source text considered by itself. It doesn't do any intermodule analysis and it doesn't do any instantiation or binding to any naming environment. Um, so we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but before we do, let me, let me go through the other parameters to make module instance, and then I'll show you what, what the module instance looks like that it returns. So the import namespace, that was kind of a key realization in how to get the phasing of module initialization right, which is the make module instance captures the import namespace to be used later, but during the execution of make module instance, it doesn't actually use the import namespace. So at the time you call make module instance, the import namespace can be empty, can be unpopulated. And then it's up to the loader to populate it with a mapping from uh, specifier names uh, to modules. And each individual module instance can, have, can be given its own unique import namespace with its own unique name to module instance mapping. So first basically, so the idea is first you make all the module instances and then Having made them, um, you then uh, populate all of their import namespaces uh, such that, that by populating their namespaces, you've determined how they're wired to each other. And then only after you've done that, do you do the module initialization um, uh, that, that causes the, the, the code, the initialization code of the modules to run. A clarification, are, are we talking here about that object that will potentially have those uh, live binding constant like things um, that uh, code inside the module will access them as if they're imported names? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, yes. And, and, and I know that isn't clear to everybody else until I, until I, show, I show them, uh, but the answer to that was yes. Yeah, so, so I, I like to call it module scope in my, in my model. Um, and, and my idea is that this scope is a particular thing for a module that, it, that is um, um, extending from the global scope. Um, and uh, in the module scope, the only things that will ever exist are kind of like constants, but they are live bindings um, in that you cannot write to them. Okay, so I, th I think I may have misspoke then when I said yes. I think I may have misunderstood the question. The import namespace is map the strings that it's mapping from are module specifier strings, not variable names. There are no variable names in the import namespace, in the import namespace itself. Uh, it's a mapping, the, the import namespace itself is a mapping from module specifier strings to module instances. The module instances in turn have the mechanisms for binding all the live bindings, but those don't show up at the top level of the import namespace. So, so this is the links table, basically. Um, it links um, between modules by specifier. Um, so it doesn't necessarily know wh when the module will become an instance of it, but just the fact that it, it's that particular unique uh, specifier for that module. Uh, maybe, sorry. Anyways, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna. I, I, I think I didn't, didn't, Understood. Let's okay. Let me let me just talk it through with regard to an example. Uh, we have um, actually I use the example. I'll actually let's let's just go directly to the example. Um, so over here we have an example module static record for a module that was hypothetically originally named bar. Um, uh, so the idea is 
that we have a translator, one very nice claim that I will make uh, about this translation uh, is the translator from the module source text to the module static record is, is, is not, does not, is not in any sense a trusted translator, uh, i.e. in the sense that we talked about uh, last week. Uh, everybody could use their own offline translator for their own code, and if their translator is bad, they only foul their own nest. But even at the level of intermodule linking semantics, uh, this is a, um, uh, this supports mutual suspicion with regard to uh, how the, how these translated modules interact with each other through this module loading mechanism. Um, so, uh, um, so the module source field is a string that in this case extends, is, is that much code, uh, is just the string that is um, the alleged original module source code and the, 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 the make module instance code we're about to see actually does not use, does not use this uh, property. Um, uh, so, this pro so I'm including this property uh, uh, as um, uh, something that's not really essential, but, but certainly helps explain examples. Uh, so everything else in this mo bar module static record is supposed to be uh, generated only by processing this text. Of course, the actual, what I wrote down was generated by hand from what I imagined the translation would be. So, um, oh, I should, I should also mention, uh, in this original source text, uh, I took the expository examples, the non-normative expository examples from the ECMAScript spec and did variations on those so that although this is far from uh, complete, it at least covers the, the case analysis that uh, uh, the ECMAScript spec authors found was uh, a, an expository a, a useful for expository purposes, case analysis for illustrating the different cases. Um, so actually, I'm going to split the screen here, split the window here. So, so, um, so given this import text over here, um, I'm trans. I, 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 that turns into uh, in the record. Uh, this, descri this description of the imports. Uh, so the idea is that, we, that, that the overall module static record has metadata that describes the static information that's needed, that's derived from, that's, that's comes from um, uh, the um, analysis of the source text. Uh, so it pulls the needed um, uh, static information out into these um, parts of the record, like the imports. So over here, I'm importing from mod, from mod one, mod two, and mod three. Uh, and uh, I'll show you the foo thing in a moment. Uh, and then this is the, the static information we need with regard to what is imported from each of those things. And then there is a bunch of exports. So with the exports, I divide it into two categories uh, because only on the exporting side do we know which things need to be treated as live bindings or not. Uh, by far the common case is that a exported variable is not a live binding. Um, uh, uh, so, um, uh, so for that case, we put it into the fixed export string Otherwise, uh, we put it into the live export string. Um, and the, uh, the foo case is, okay, these cases over here are the weird ones that I wasn't even aware were in the language until I went through the spec for part, as part of this exercise, where you can import from one module and re-export what you imported 
uh, as your own exports without ever binding it to a local variable name. Um, uh, so I decided to, to support that as well. So um, in that case, let's take the export G as H from foo. Neither G nor H is a local lexical variable. G is a, is a name as exported by foo. H is a name as exported by bar. Um, so I'm sorry, G, is, well, ex, as ex, G saying G as exported by foo is the same uh, as what I mean by G as imported from foo. Um, so that's reflected over here by saying uh, from foo we import F and G. And then it's reflected over here in the live exports by saying uh, uh, we, that this module exports both F and H. So, so uh, sorry to interrupt here because uh, that, that's a very, very interesting um, uh, you know, distinction between um, uh, this, the way the spec is worded is technically um, um, this module does not import G at all, but rather um, redirect um, and export as one of its exported bindings without ever having uh, import reference to it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I believe this code is observational equivalent to that, i.e. That, that, that it conforms to the spec with regard to that. Uh, and that was actually, that actually caused a major change in my development of it is because the re, my first attempt at doing this, my re-export failed to be live. And it took me a while to figure out how the re-exporting of it maintained the live binding nature. Uh, so this does do that. Um, but, but it still does have it under the import records. As, I don't think that's a, observable in any way. Uh, okay, but, but, but uh, implementation-wise, does it, does it require this module's um, instantiation uh, process to um, in any way uh, uh, interrogate or inspect G? Uh, uh, it, uh, yes. Uh, yeah. uh, if that's observable, as, if that's a observable difference from the spec, I'm actually surprised. It's, it's execution wise because it theoretically does not need to await G for that module to execute its body. Um, whereas it needs to await anything else. Um, so it will await foo only if it imports into okay. its body anything from foo. But if it okay. only reacts. So, so, so hold, hold on, let me stop you here because you're saying await. Uh, I don't do any awaiting here. I don't deal with top level await. No, no, like I mean, it, it, uh, the, uh, the, body, the body of a module uh, only execute once all of its uh, imported uh, names um, um, are bound, and if it depends on a particular um, hoisted or non-hoisted uh, binding, then it, the execution of that module will have to occur after the execution of the particular module for which the binding um, is not a TDZ uh, violation. Do you see what I'm trying to say? So it doesn't await as an async await or top up await. But so I, I think I see the issue you're getting at. I'd, ha I'd have to think about it to see if there's a, a real problem. But I see that there's certainly something to think about here. Uh, and that there might be a problem. Um, so, so noted, um, uh, I might get the initialization order and the TDZ wrong. But let me say right at the outset, uh, altogether, in order to do, in order to meet my other goals, I found that I needed it to be inaccurate for some of the TDZ cases. There are some cases where the module semantics would have the implementation throw a reference error, where uh, this implementation uh, will instead produce the undefined value for a live binding that should have been in a temporal dead zone. Uh, and, and given the overall goals here, I think that that was, um, you know, if, if I have to make, if there is indeed a conflict between the goals, then, then uh, for the goals that I have, I'm, 
I, I think that was the right choice. Um, but altogether, I'm trying to, uh, to the degree to which I can satisfy my goals without conflict, I was trying to be as accurate as I could be on TDZ, um, uh, as well as the, um, as well as in general, the initialization order uh, and the handling of cycles. And I definitely share in that um, uh, sentiment uh, because um, TDZ has been, um, conformance to TDZ has been one of the very, very uh, disruptive aspects of people trying to, uh, like, like in Node, for instance, trying to implement uh, interop with CommonJS. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I was very curious as to the rationalization because uh, if the spec needs to uh, be um, usable by everyone, then um, uh, the, the, the constraints of TDZ in it might, might be worth uh, revisiting a little bit. Um, so, so I do appreciate that you, you put that, uh, uh, you, you put those words, you know, the way you did. Mm -hmm. Yep, thanks. So, uh, so in any case, so there's the imports record, the live exports record, the fixed exports record. And the, uh, the you know, and, and it's really doing this really clarified for me uh, the distinct namespaces that the spec uses. Because, for example, the code I was showing last week completely confused export names and local names. Um, and it took me a while to figure out how to correctly treat them separately. Uh, so over here, for example, in the live exports, um, uh, what this is saying is that the, actually, let's take this one. The export name EX uh, corresponds to the local lexical variable name LO. Um, uh, and with this, and, and concretely, what this means, which you'll see concretely in a moment, uh, is that in the module namespace record that we produce, that is supposed to correspond to the specified exotic module namespace object, uh, that the name to bind there is ex. In the endowments record that we provide to the proxy for purposes of um, uh, faulting on assignment to implement TDZ um, uh, 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 without rewrite of um, uh, code in the module, without rewrite of, of in particular, of, of functions contained in the module. We have to trap assignments in the proxy. Uh, and um, for those, the relevant name is LO, the lexical variable name, not EX. And it took me a embarrassingly long amount of time before I realized that I was using the wrong name in the, in the wrong place. Um, the only place in this code, in fact, where I use the local variable names is the live export. So I'm thinking of simplifying uh, this record format and the code to get, as this to do says, uh, to get rid of the local variable names from the fixed exports record and the import record. Okay. This is the important thing, which I'll now go back to full screen on. Um, I took the, um, when the, the rewriter parsed uh, the original module source text, it rewrote it into this text. And uh, uh, you know, I make a claim about this thing being minimally invasive, um, uh, uh, because it's only rewriting exports and imports. But over here, of course, it's maximally invasive because the example consisted of only imports and exports. So I was only, I was only showing the things that needed the rewrite. Um, uh, the idea here is that uh, all of the importing, including the implicit importing from the exports that, that import and re-export, modulo the issues that Sala just raised, um, uh, but I rewrite basically all of the imports into this call to dollar $H under bar import. And this will be, um, as we talked about, a, a dollar $H um, zero width joiner thing under bar import or whatever. But it's whatever our, uh, our um, convention is for names that we also uh, verify that the original source did not contain. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, the imports, when we aggregate the imports, we see that here are the 
local lexical variable names in aggregate. These are the total set of local lexical variable names that are created in those import declarations. Um, those import declarations are importing from mod one, mod two, mod three, and foo. And, um, uh, and then uh, the import names, uh, the import names consist uh, of the normal identifier names as well as the special names default and star. Um, uh, default is for the default export, which, which you can also do, uh, import as the default import. Star is only on the importing side. There is no star on the exporting side. And star means uh, bind this thing to the module namespace object itself. And then uh, here's the really cool thing, which is uh, what we do for each of these import names is we provide uh, in, in this argument to uh, H import, we provide these callback functions. We provide a list of callback functions um, uh, where uh, each callback function is there in order to bind or update one of these lexical variable names. So in particular, now I'll go split screen again. Right, so here import star as ns from mod one. And over here we say, we see that mod one star, the callback updates the ns variable. Uh, this is the place where we, uh, the, the updates are, are rerun when necessary in order to continue to update these. That's why these are live bindings. Uh, but that also makes clear how we fail to do temporal dead zone, which is one of the goals of this free write was efficiency for the typical case. And at the importing side, uh, uh, given separate translation, given that we translate each mo module without any intermodule analysis, which was another goal, um, uh, therefore from the importing side, uh, we can't see which variables are live, bond, live bound and not. Uh, and we want in the typical case to map these to a regular local lexical variable name. Uh, we could have placed the lexical variable name so that the lexical variable names themselves had a TDZ, but we have no way to make them transition out of TDZ at the importing side when they should according to the live binding semantics. So instead we just gave up on the TDZ for the import variables um, and uh, they're just let bound at the beginning meaning they're immediately bound to undefined. Um, uh, so the use of the import variables um, if you use them early will give you back undefined rather than a reference error. And I'm willing to live with that. It's, it's, it's an explainable difference. Um, uh, it's, it is a potential security hazard compared to SES as specified, but it's an explainable security hazard. Uh, and I'm willing to just define uh, what it means to be correct SES um, uh, so, that the, so that correct SES code has to not be vulnerable to that hazard. Uh, there's nothing about that hazard that's inconsistent with object capability principles. So, so I do. I do have one one uh, devil advocate kind of. Um, um, if um, you know the, the getter approach that I showed, um, it basically um, it wraps arrow functions uh, that point to the uh, the exported names or the namespace, and so before before all, uh, any name any namespace um, uh, statements execute. Um, in all modules, you get all those getters that refer to the scoped variables that will be exported. Um, I'm, I'm designing this under, initially under the assumption that 
Um, if any of those getters is called before um, the variable declaration or the whatever declaration they're pointing to uh, is effectively a PDZ uh, state, um, then uh, calling that would actually um, throw um, because right. okay. the, getter, the getter violates the TDZ um, on behalf of the um, importer but that calls it early. Okay, so that's correct. Uh, that, that, that the getter naturally does that. And I am using that on the module namespace object. But for the normal import, I don't want to fault to a getter. I don't want to fault through a proxy. And I don't want to rewrite the use occurrences of the variable. And if I don't rewrite either of them, then I can't have a use occurrence of the variable uh, cause an invocation of the getter. Okay, the second part to this, um, and I, I'm sorry, I'm uh, trying to be uh, thorough early on, um, because you know, if we refine the model, um, I, I really think there could be good recommendations to uh, you know, the next uh, uh, ES updates. Um, I, I've seen it early on in implementations, and I believe they were using the LED approach for the imports. Um, it is a violation for me to uh, write uh, against V, N, S, X, or W. Um, so when they all uh, Sorry, say that again. I didn't follow it. Uh, so if my code... Also, I should say that we're way over time and given our, our previous discussions. Uh, I'll, let's get through this question and answer on this particular issue, and then I'm going to go ahead and okay. address it today. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, I, I, I do apologize about the. Um, sorry, I'm the one who went over way over time. <laughs> well, I, I think I'm the one who did that. But anyways, uh, so so here we have the let. I, I'm I'm just saying that uh, if in my module body, I somehow executed code un um, un unaware to the loader or the you know unaware to the devices of the module system. I, I, I assigned to V, N, S, or X, or W, where I shouldn't be able to. Um, uh, it actually happened in early implementations in browsers, where you could import something, you could change the value of whatever you imported. And until somehow, magically, that let value is updated, uh, my V was out of uh, sync with what the imported value was. Okay, so good, good. Um, uh, so there's, uh, that reminds me of something that I didn't say that's actually very important, which is uh, in the semantics of JavaScript, uh, it's already the case that an imported variable cannot be assigned to within the module that imported it. So my finding is a read-only view and that the variable can only be assigned to in the module that exported it. Therefore, the parser and rewriter is in a position without intermodule analysis to reject any code that attempts to assign to a lexical variable that, uh, uh, that um, whose defining occurrence was an import. And if all cases are covered? That's a great oh, oh. The eval cases for the shim, for what I'm trying to do here, which is just enable this for the shim, um, uh, I cannot emulate direct eval. The shim, it's, it's just impossible for this shim to, exit, to, to emulate direct eval. So will it be a blacklisted? Uh, uh, actually, I need to do that in the same, since I can't emulate direct eval, um, I'm glad you reminded me of that because I knew that, that there was something else I needed to statically reject at, in the realm shim uh, because I couldn't emulate it. And that was it. That was the one I was forgetting. So we're currently already statically rejecting in the realm shim by a conservative regex, uh, the import expression. And uh, we're also um, rejecting the HTML I'm sorry, in, in uh, this branch that I'm showing you, uh, I've not yet merged into the main line. I also have a regex for statically rejecting the HTML comments. I need to merge that in. But that's the third one, is I need to statically reject 
the direct eval syntax because the direct eval syntax um, uh, might, might be a direct, might, might be something that was intended to be a direct eval. And uh, if allowed to execute in CES, uh, would actually execute as an, as an emulated indirect eval, because that's the bizarre meaning of evaluating that syntax when the eval lexical variable is bound to something other than the original eval function. So, uh, so, I, so I will ban that. Uh, I'll ban, ban that at the realm level. Um, uh, and banning, banning it redundantly in the uh, module, rewrite, module rewrite is a fine thing to do, especially because the module rewrite assumes an accurate parser, so I can ban it more accurately there. Um, um, so, so sorry, uh, clarifying about banning it on a realm level, a realm where a module loader um, it, it is I'm, loading. I'm, I'm sorry, banning it in the realm shim is what I meant to say. Oh, like, is there any other parts of the shim where direct eval is not basically uh, semantically uh, same or same? Uh, the, the, um, all of the code that evaluates under the shim uh, evaluates with eval bound to our safe eval wrapper that um, uh, where the safe eval imposes the, the SES confinement semantics, obviously, if you could get the original eval, you would completely escape the sandbox. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but we, there's no way to, to um, uh, there's, there's no safe way to emulate a direct eval um, uh, with the, the, the mechanism that we're using for the shim. Um, uh, so therefore, I should just reject the syntax rather than run the syntax with, with a meaning other than the meaning we're trying to emulate. Okay, so yeah, I'll think about that a bit because I, I think I have an alternative that might, might, might be um, open. Okay. Yeah, I, I, we'll talk about it later on. I don't want to take more time, sorry. Okay, um, so uh, there's a lot more to say about this code, but as I expected, um, uh, I'll have to um, uh, complete that next time. Uh, and I think this was a, a very productive meeting. Uh, thanks, thank you everyone. Thank you.